Okay, well, I'm going to get us started as usual as people trickle in. Um, welcome back. Hope everyone had a nice Thanksgiving break. This is our second to last seminar of autumn quarter. I'm grateful for the audience and their attention. Again, this uh, seminar series would not have been possible without the great support of the Bill Lane Center for the American West, the Woods Institute, as well as Stanford Sustainability Data Science. I'm pleased that we get to round out our quarter with an awesome talk by someone at Stanford who does I was a cutting edge research in the area of wildfires, and I think you'll be most interested in this talk today. We've got Professor Matthias Ema in the house. He is a professor who is jointly appointed in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and the Department of Photon Science at SLAC. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering and a Master of Science degree in Computational Engineering. In 2008, he received his PhD in Mechanical Engineering here from Stanford. And then after being on the faculty of aerospace engineering at the University of Michigan for five years, he returned to Stanford in 2013, and he has been here since then. He is a decorated researcher and has received many uh, awards for his work, including being an NSF, NSF Career Award winner, ONR Young Investigator Award winner, an AFOSR Young Investigator Award winner, and a NASA Early Career Faculty Award winner a Hiroshi Suji Early Career Research Award, and most recently he has won the Bessel Award of Alexander Von Humboldt Foundation. His research interests are diverse, but are broadly based on computational modeling of reactive, reacting flows, the development of numerical models, and the investigation of advanced energy conversion concepts and molecular processes. Today he's going to talk to us about his own work looking at embers and how uh, you can use cutting edge uh, X-ray techniques to look at them. And that's an important element of you might, many of us must know about how wildfires spread. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Matthias and I'm glad to have him here today. Uh, thank you, Derek, for the kind introductions. I really appreciate this and of course, uh, welcome to the, the seminar. Uh, that's certainly a, a great audience and I attended many of them. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, to present some of our work uh, that we have uh, been uh, conducting over the recent years, and this is concerned with X-ray measurements. And before I move on and uh, go into the technical details, I'd really like to take a second here and introduce uh, the main researchers that actually have done this uh, this work. Uh, so this is uh, Emmerich Bonnet. He was a graduate student, graduated last year. Uh, um, we have uh, Robert Bennett and um, Adam Wang, they are at the medical school uh, and they are actually bringing their X-ray expertise to this uh, project. And we have uh, folks from the Advanced Light Source in Berkeley or the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, this is Dula Parkinson and, and Harold uh, Barnard. So really appreciate uh, the collaborations um, that really led to this product. So the focus here is on amber transport and um, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with amber transport, but I thought it's probably appropriate to look at one of these uh, pictures here. And uh, this is a an, um, an, uh, consequence of the Bear Fires, the uh, uh, Northern Complex Fire in uh, 2020. I'm sure many of you perhaps can remember some of the pictures, but what we're seeing here is uh, small scale spotting effects. We're essentially seeing localized isolate um, uh, fires. And this has to do with amber transport. So what is amber? We can really think about this as embers are small particles uh, they are glowing, they contain a certain amount of energy, and as they're depositing uh, on unburned land, they can essentially uh, ignite uh, fires. This is illustrated here in the form from firebrand showers, uh, but we're also seeing the spotting effect where uh, fires can essentially propagate over several hundreds of uh, uh, feet, uh, if not uh, miles away from the fire front, and they are, uh, ignite uh, secondary fires. What is interesting on this is <clears throat> if you're looking to uh, the characterization of these embers, you're typically seeing that they are very small, especially those that uh, are propagated fairly far uh, upstream. And typically on the order of few centimeters and uh, weights of a few grams. So it, it's really not bigger than a sugar cube if you really want to think about this. And that's really what we're interested in. Is despite the small size, actually there's a lot of physics that is contained on this for which we have very little understanding. And what I like to do here is in this presentation is to elude this, um, this physics by using X-ray imaging, or more specifically, X-ray computer tomography. 
So what you can think about is ember transport, the phase of ember is essentially generated by fires. So if we have fires, if you're burning out a uh, large um, uh, connected um, uh, biomass in the form of um, trees, wood, and so on, this will be typically lofted in the air. It burns out and essentially deposits uh, further downstream. Uh, there's a really interesting balance between lift drag uh, forces on the particle, as well as the geometry of the systems. But what's really interesting is to understand this very complex interplay between uh, the particles, this ember, uh, the depositions, and really understanding what is the mechanisms that lead to this transport, okay? So, but ember is not only relevant for wildfires, it is also relevant for smoldering processes. And this turns out to be a significant source of uh, biomass consumptions. There are estimates that about 50% of the biomass is consumed by this very low, low oxygen containing smoldering process. And this can be as much as 50%, as, as, as I said, right? So very slow uh, processes typically occurring in oxygen depleted environments where we don't have invisible flame. And you can also extend this to peat fires, uh, not so relevant here in the Western part of, uh, uh, of the United States, but you find them in um, um, Ireland quite frequently, as well as in the Eastern part, where we have some of these um, coal reserves. Uh, very slow processes, so it has a wide ranging applications. And this process that I'm describing here, the pyrolysis, the smoldering is relevant for a number of these this applications. Right? So what is a fire and what, I, what can we contribute to the understanding of the system? It turns out it's a rather complex process. And here you're seeing this uh, image of this um, 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 of this bonfire. Uh, we are identifying unsteady uh, flames. This is typically happening in the gas phase. We are defending soot formations and radiations, which is a key mechanisms for the fire advancement. Uh, we're seeing smoldering and pyrolysis. It really happens in the solid phase. And that's in primary interest of this work. Uh, multi-phase heat transfer between uh, the solid, the gas phase, uh, and perhaps also some of this liquid phase, which is shed off, uh, and as well as uh, the ash formation. So what I like to do here in this presentation is to mostly examine uh, the ash formation and this smoldering pyrolysis process uh, for the reason that this is a uh, primary source of uncertainties and poor understanding currently in our community. So what can we think about this pyrolysis? Um, in simplest form, we can represent this by two reactions. Uh, we refer to this as chemical reactions. The first one is a pyrolysis reaction. We are essentially taking bio biomass in the solid form. We are adding heat. Uh, so we are really exerting this to a high temperature environment. And this can happen in the absence of oxygen. What is formed is char and pyrolysate. Pyrolysate is essentially flammable gases essentially emanating from this uh, from the biomass uh, as a consequence of the pyrolysis. The second mechanism is the flaming. And here we are essentially burning off this pyrolysate in a gaseous form uh, by reaction with oxygen. And this leads to combustion products, um, uh, CO2 and water in its simple form, but more complex hydrocarbons um, and pollutants uh, and heat. So this is an exothermic process. And by this, we have this complex coupling by the uh, between pyrolysis and flaming. What we like to understand is this first reaction step, primarily, uh, as this is a bottleneck or a key critical reaction pathways for uh, the subsequent flaming process. Okay. Lastly, we have a smoldering process uh, where we are essentially burning off the residual char. Um, so we also will take a look at this uh, using this X-ray imaging that I'm that, is, that I'm describing. Okay, so what is this X-ray imaging and how can we use this? I'm sure many of you are familiar with this uh, process, but it turns out that if you're taking one of these amber transports, it's fairly difficult to get any meaningful insight in the systems, simply for the reason that this is a solid um, uh, particle. It's really difficult to interrogate experimentally. And typically what we are gleaning from them is um, in global combustion products and fuel conversion, which is in many cases, not quite useful uh, for uh, developing physical models or making uh, detailed predictions of the uh, amber transport and uh, uh, thermochemical processes. Right? So with this, we have a number of research challenges, uh, the accurate predictions and modeling of the flaming extinctions, uh, the shrinkage and oxida oxidations of the pyrolysates, and the multidimensional dynamics, which essentially has to do with the shrinking of this amber transports. Uh, experiments, as I said, 
are typically done by using probes, masks, global scales. Uh, but what we like to do is uh, we might like to use uh, X-ray imaging here as it has several advantages. Number one, it provides in very high penetration, so we can essentially interrogate the solid structure. It has no refractions. Uh, with this, um, we don't get any secondary effects. We can measure both the gas phase and the solid phase, and by this, can essentially construct and complete a picture. And furthermore, what we can also do is we can decide between different uh, solid states, uh, such as ash, char, and the solid biomass. And this makes it really interesting in order to get some meaningful insights within the pore structure. The system that I'm describing looks as follows. We have here uh, this biomass particle. As I said, uh, think about this as a small sugar cube size. This is representative, and this is currently only limited uh, by our um, uh, experimental access. Ultimately, we can extend this to large scale systems. But by examining this unit physics processes, I think we have a pretty good understanding of the, of the dynamics. Uh, what you're also seeing in this image is the gas phase temperature. Uh, this is shown here in this color code, in this rainbow color. Uh, you're seeing uh, this high flame temperature, uh, which is impinging uh, the nano, uh, this um, uh, biomass particle. And you're seeing then this complex dynamics in this instantaneous image. Right? So what I'd like to do is to walk you through this experimental setup and to really describe what we can learn from this biomass combustion product. Right? So what is X-ray computer tomography? What we really have is we have an X-ray source. But unlike uh, your medical scanner or uh, and, and chest X-ray, here we are essentially fixating uh, the source and uh, the X-ray source and the detector, and we are moving the particles. So you're seeing here essentially our rotating table. The simple the sample is rotated, and what we're typically measuring is the intensity, how much of the X-rays, the X-ray energy uh, photons, are absorbed in the solid particles, and this gives us an idea about the density to first order. Uh, for those of you familiar with this uh, principle. We essentially using uh, Beer Lambert's law, which is an uh, absorption uh, measurements of the intensity. And what we have is uh, one key parameter here, which is essentially this linear attenuation coefficient mu. Right? That's what we seek to uh, extract from this uh, model. And once we have information about this linear attenuation coefficient, we can relate this to uh, material properties, such as biomass, ash, gas phase temperature, and uh, uh, and uh, char, right? So that's really the key idea. And here I'm showing you already uh, one of the key results. Uh, this is uh, our biomass sample. You're seeing different, just by visual inspection, you see different um, uh, uh, properties. We see ash, uh, you see some of the charring in the biomass, this wood unburned uh, structure. And by essentially exposing this to this X-ray imaging, we can see that because of the different weight of each one of these quantities, you can clearly identify uh, the linear attenuation coefficients corresponding to the biomass. Typically has a very high attenuations. Uh, we see here this uh, charring regions and the gas phase, which has to really a very low attenuation, right? So there are very few molecules which absorbs the photons and this essentially constitutes these problems, okay? So that's our idea. you are measuring this, looking to the linear attenuation coefficient can relate this to the density and from this infer physical meaning. Right. So what we're also recognizing is in order to measure the gas phase temperature, you're typically seeing that the linear attenuation is about three orders of magnitude smaller than if you look into a solid gas. Right. So this makes it fairly difficult in order to probe both the gas phase and the solid phase simply for the reason of this wide differences in a uh, wide range of, of, of densities. Right. So in order to bridge this gap, what we are doing is we're using krypton. Krypton is a very radio dense uh, gas absorbs a lot of photon and by this uh, simplifies our measurements. So by doping our gas phase with krypton, we have essentially one way uh, for measuring uh, the temperature field. And this is essentially done in the form of calibration. So the gas phase temperature is nothing else than a ratio or a linear relation between the attenuation coefficients, and uh, you're seeing this quantity here, and some reference state. And by this, we have direct ways of extracting the temperature. Right, so with this, we have essentially the full uh, measurement capability. We can measure both gas phase temperature and the solid phase. And we are furthermore able to delineate the solid phase between biomass, char, and, uh, and ash products. Right? Now, let's take a look at 
uh, the experimental setup and how we are utilizing this. As I mentioned, this is a uh, tabletop or laboratory CT scanner. This is available in the medical school um, uh, with Adam and um, Adam Wang's um, uh, research group. You're seeing it set up, uh, you're recognizing uh, the source, the X-ray source, that's simply an X-ray tube. We are identifying the X-ray detector. And this is our burner here sitting on an optical table, which is rotating, right? So with this, you're getting essentially uh, high repetition rate measurements um, uh, from the system. The experimental setup looks as follows. Uh, in this probe, you might recognize here this little tube. This is a quartz tube. It will have a diameter, a few inches in diameter. We are supplying this with krypton, nitrogen, and oxygen to provide our reactive gas environment. Uh, for some of the setups that we're uh, considering is we're using a coil heater to provide the heat for either the pyrolysis or in flame for combustion. And then we are observing how this particle is consumed during this combustion stage. Right. Uh, the samples are typically half an inch in uh, cross-section. Um, the sample lifetime is somewhere around uh, 30 minutes. Um, so if you're burning this fully down, and we can acquire every 30 seconds uh, one of our three-dimensional uh, images. Right. So that's some rather rapid uh, measurements, and this really allows us to monitor the dynamics of the systems. Okay. So here's a picture of this uh, system. You're seeing. Um, the biomass, uh, this white front, I will talk about this uh, later on. One of them is a pyrolysis front. The second one is the smoldering front. And you see here this red region, the combustion uh, phase as the flame essentially impinges on the particles or some of the pyrolysis, pyrolysides are combusted during the combustion process. Okay. So then let's move on and uh, see what physics we can extract. What we have done as part of this experiment is burn different biomass um, uh, samples. Uh, so this included uh, oak, um, um, uh, ductless fir, and um, uh, birch. Um, these are all uh, fuels or uh, uh, biomass that you find, and it's relevant for a number of applications. What I'm showing you here is uh, just the combustion of oak, as it's a rather relevant uh, fuel for a number of applications. And by looking to just to one parametric variations, uh, including the change in the oxygen concentration, you're seeing already in quite different image. So what I'm plotting here is um, a movie as the surface of the spiromass sample recesses. And you can imagine that for very low oxygen concentrations, we have very little combustibility gases, and we have a slow surface recess illustrated here by this color coding in terms of the recess speed in units of millimeters per minute. So it's a rather slow process. And if you increase the oxygen concentration, you're actually seeing that there's a substantially faster surface recess. And furthermore, you're also identifying the crack formations um, at a later stage right now here uh, due to the burnout and fractures of the biomass. Right? So we can extract all of this at very good quality and accuracy. And this provides uh, information uh, to advance our fundamental physics, physical understanding, as well as developing uh, improved modeling capabilities um, All right, so then I want to move on uh, to the next slide and give you a sequence here on the different behaviors that not only can we observe the surface reactions, but you can also look inside this biomass. And this is illustrated here on this graph. Uh, you have seen similar graphs uh, before. Uh, this is 6% oxygen uh, uh, oak and in combustion environment. Uh, what we're really seeing is we are uh, arranging the pore structures uh, with the um, uh, approaching uh, flame. And this essentially has the benefits or the, uh, the uh, physical setup that the outgassing of the parallel shots, uh, essentially directly evolves along this um, uh, along this pores. Right? So what we're finding is primarily burnout of this um, um, pyrolysis front along this pore structures uh, shown in blue with very low uh, density. We're seeing, we're seeing a very strong rupture and fracture uh, during this transient process. Right. So what we are not observing for this case is uh, flaming of the systems. And the reason for this is that the oxygen concentration is very low. Right? Um, and you're clearly seeing this in this uh, in this little image there. Now, if you're increasing, if you're looking to uh, the same configurations but increased oxygen concentrations, what you're seeing immediately is this very strong red regions here associated with a high temperature environment. And this essentially implies that during the pyrolysis, this first stage of the reactions, uh, we are outgassing um, 
the pyrolysats. They will essentially evolve along this uh, pores and interact with this high temperature reacting environments to form a secondary flame. And this is what you're also seeing in this movie uh, or in this uh, little still image. I'm sorry, uh, in this little still images where the surfaces are much larger, uh, much, much redder. And uh, you're seeing essentially this uh, high temperature combustion region. Right, so with this, we have this very precise measurement that allows us to diagnose uh, the combustion uh, involving the smoldering, but also the subsequent pyrolysis. We're extending this further. Uh, we can do quantitative analysis. Uh, I mentioned already the speed uh, of the flame. That's really interesting for model developments, as it's a primary performance quantity of this um, of the uh, model developments. And what you're really finding is substantial differences by as much as a factor of five or six higher uh, flame speeds or uh, surface recess speeds uh, in the flaming regions. Uh, but we're also seeing uh, substantial differences in the secondary stage associated with smoldering, where the oxidation front, uh, this is this primary uh, front, uh, has substantial differences in the system, right? So just because of the consequence of the higher oxygen concentrations, right? So what I really think is most exciting here in this context is that this is a very precise data that allows us to validate uh, different models and we're currently working uh, 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 with uh, Lawrence Silvermore uh, National Lab to actually use this for uh, validations of uh, biomass combustion. And I mentioned already that we can also examine effects of um, uh, the biomass alignments, um, the grain structure. This really has relevance uh, for optimizing systems and better understanding uh, the variability in the biomass. So it's really in parameter uh, to understand uh, uncertainties or variations in uh, the biomass combustion. Uh, by looking to the consumed mass, uh, shown here in uh, blue, and the temperature of the sample, we're observing in a substantial shift um, depending on the grain alignment. And again, this helps us essentially to understand uh, uncertainties in existing models, as well as uh, modeling uh, biomass combustion, amber transport, but uh, also smoldering in a, in a probabilistic sense. Okay. To illustrate this, uh, here this is um, again an, an uh, image, an X-ray image, showing the different uh, alignments uh, in the context of an oak sample. Uh, the flow or the, uh, the flame is aligned across the grain. Uh, here at the bottom, it's aligned uh, along the grain. And we're, we are seeing quite substantial differences in the combustion process. And this essentially can explain the variations that we are seeing by using different modeling approaches or also experiments, uh, depending on the alignment of the biomass. Right. Um, I mentioned before that we have extended this um, uh, experiments to probe different uh, uh, fuel properties, including oak, walnut, and ductless fuel. And what you're seeing here is just an uh, illustration of the sensitivities of these uh, fuel samples uh, to the internal structure. Clearly, uh, the ductless sphere has very large um, uh, uh, grain structures. Uh, turns out that they burn preferably in this structure and have a much higher uh, burning rate. And uh, with this technique, we are able to um, elucidate uh, this process at a uh, final representation. Uh, so let me briefly uh, uh, conclude here and um, summarize that standard medical uh, scanners, laboratory scanners that are available in a wide range of uh, medical institutions are readily available to probe uh, biomass combustion and provide some high quality uh, experimental data that is much needed in the wildfire community to anchor models to understand um, ember transport at a more physical fundamental level. What we showed you here is a uh, technique that allows us to do simultaneous measurements of the gas phase and the solid phase um, uh, combustion processes. And let's say that we push the technology uh, to get, um, I would say, very fast measurements that really allows us to uh, observe the dynamics um, during this uh, ember process. Uh, what we currently don't have available, uh, but are interested in uh, uh, advancing is uh, augmenting those measurements with speciation measurements. And there are some ideas on how to use probe samples uh, so that we get a more complete uh, picture about uh, the gas based combustion process, right? But what I have not mentioned so far is, is the detailed understanding about uh, the fine grain structures 
And for this, we're essentially going to Berkeley to the advanced light source, uh, where we're essentially getting a much, much fine-grained uh, uh, understanding. And I think this is uh, quite exciting. So I'd like to share this with you. If you go on the left-hand side, is uh, a standard laboratory CT scanner, or you can think about an, a medical scanner. Um, by elevating the system um, and using an, a synchrotron source, uh, for instance, available at, at that one's light source, um, that one's photon source at um, Chicago, uh, or um, um, here at Slack, we essentially have substantial benefits, and they come about by two things. Number one is uh, the spatial resolution. So we can go from a typical 300 micrometer spatial resolution on a laboratory scanner down to three micrometers. So we're gaining two orders of magnitude. But what's more importantly is we're also getting a higher photon flux. What I mean here with the photo photon flux is in penetration, the signals become just much sharper and we reduce the sampling time. And this makes it really interesting and you know, improve the spatial and temp temporal accuracy of this, of this measurements. Right. Um, so I want to go back to this uh, um, uh, pyrolysis experiments. And what we're now looking is at the same samples, but we can downscale them and get a much finer uh, understanding about the initial pyrolysis and the microstructure response uh, of the biomass samples. So for this, we are exclusively looking at the process of pyrolysis. And we are doing this in such a way that we are heating our sample. So what you're seeing here is the small samples. Uh, they are only a few millimeters in diameter. You're putting them in a quartz tube, and then we're using a high power lamp heating system in order to heat this uh, system. And this is an experimental setup uh, by um, uh, Harold Barnard and Dula uh, that came up with this design and we're essentially adapting this here to this, to this problem. So that's a really interesting um, setup because it allows us to isolate the combustion from the pyrolysis, and more importantly, control the heat flux to the sample at uh, extremely fine uh, uh, precision. Right. I have to say that this total energy of six megawatts per square meter um, is typically representative of of, bio, um, of uh, wildfire. So it's a really relevant uh, operating conditions that we're looking at here. Right. So the samples are, as I said, a um, um, few millimeters in thickness but we can actually resolve this at a very high accuracy and this makes it interesting. Uh, for those of you interested in, uh, there are a couple of parameters. Uh, so if you take a biomass sample, you can really think about chemical processes and heat transfer. And this essentially <clears throat> boils down to two critical parameters. One of them is the so-called bio number. And this is essentially in hood, a, a nusset number for solid materials. It measures the resistance of heat conductions in a solid. And the second parameter, which is relevant, is the dump killer number. And this really gives us an idea about um, the competition between advections and chemical timescales, right? So two of the parameters uh, are relevant, bio number and dump killer number. One of them is uh, measuring or assessing the heat transfer. The second one is the chemical reactivity. And here we're using conditions which are very sensitive to both parameters, right? So let me get started uh, with a simple sample. And this is uh, oak. And you're looking essentially to a compounding picture here. Figure on the left-hand side is a cross-section uh, of this oak sample, where we are successively heating this, uh, this sample with this um, uh, surface heaters um, at temperature increments of about 10 to 15 uh, degrees Celsius, Celsius per, Kelvin, uh, per minute. And what you're seeing here quite nicely is essentially the shrinkage of this biomass uh, sample. So as I said, figure on the left is a cross-section, uh, figure here at the lower right is in side view sections. And then we can perform statistical analysis on the samples to observe the mass and the volume decay in the system. Right? So what's interesting on this system is the first observation is, well, there's a very complex uh, deformation of the systems. And the shrinkage, I should say, is currently modeled fairly homogeneous. So what we are assuming is, if you're modeling amber transport or biomass transport is, that the aspect ratio shrinks in proportion Clearly, this is not the case here, right? So we're seeing quite some deviations from this homogeneous shrinkage. And this is already in very useful information in order to recalibrate uh, existing models. Second thing that you're seeing is that depending on the biomass, you actually have a completely different structures and this will affect the deformation. So I'm moving on by increasing the heating ratio, but I'm also switching the biomass. So this is on the left-hand side, walnut. Figure on the right-hand side is birch. And what you're seeing quite nicely here is 
that the internal structure is quite differently. And you can identify two distinct um, uh, pyrolysis regimes. The first one is this very rapid shrinking. And the second one is kind of this residual heating. And I will show you um, physical evidence for this as we go along here in this, in this slide deck. So very different behavior. And this essentially shows us the strong sensitivities, uh, not only to the chemical compositions of the biomass, but also to the structural arrangements of the biomass. Right? So let me move on here and uh, look to some uh, of the more quantitative results, um, where we are here looking again to the uh, birch at a rather extensive heating. So this is a very rapid heating uh, rate uh, of this uh, system, finding some fractures here. But what you're really observing is an initial phase uh, uh, for the first um, 10 to 15 uh, minutes, where we have this very rapid decrease in the, uh, in the mass of the sample. This has to do with the pyrolysis. Then we're getting this rather homogeneous um, flat regions, and this blue region is essentially a cooling period, which is not relevant. Right? So two distinct regimes. I refer to this, the first one, as an devolatization uh, regime. Um, and this is typically happening at temperatures below 500 degrees Celsius. And this has to do with the decomposition of this very large uh, cellulose um, uh, compounds. This is then followed by in char devolutions, um, has to do with the small oxidations of the, or the, the decompositions of the uh, charring materials, and then essentially followed uh, by a cooling period. If you're cooling the system, it expands and we're increasing the volume of this of the system. Right? So that's kind of the three different spaces here, and they will change depending on the biomass in the fuel sample. So with this, uh, let me provide you a physical uh, understanding or more importantly, a chemical understanding. As I said, uh, what we found quite interesting is to understand uh, the devolatizations and the chart devolatization process uh, in a little bit more detail. And we can rationalize this in the following process. So if you have the cellulose polymer, which is a very large chained hydrocarbon structure, um, polymer uh, ring structure, uh, by exposing this to heat, we're seeing essentially the fractures of these rings. To, to the decomposition of the smaller and smaller rings. So this is essentially in classical depolymerization uh, reactions. The second stage, this char devolization, happens in the following regions, where we essentially have this monomer fragmentations, and we are essentially abstracting hydroxyl radicals, uh, other uh, uh, methyl groups uh, from the systems, and with this, starting to assemble this into charged structures, which are essentially large hydrocarbon uh, ring structures. Right. So with this, we have essentially in good explanations of the first stage of the prioritization um, uh, and the second stage of this prioritizations, and we can now connect this uh, to the chemical reaction pathways uh, to guide the informations of this um, uh, of, the, of the chemical description of this of these processes. Okay, um, so with this, uh, let me uh, conclude here uh, this presentation. So what I try to show you is how we can use uh, X-ray computed tomography, which I said in many cases are readily available in many institutions uh, to um, apply this to a rather interesting problem of amber transport or biomass uh, pyrolysis. Uh, I showed you here some developments at the experimental uh, level to improve accuracy, acquisition speeds, and also measure uh, gas phase and solid phase uh, properties. Uh, we use this technique to extract some physical uh, informations from uh, a number of uh, biomass samples. Um, I would say they are currently in a canonical form, and this really helps us to inform the development of improved physical models, as well as uh, guiding the physical understanding. The so next step, as I said, what we'd like to do is to extend um, those techniques to also uh, uh, measure the gas phase uh, compositions, and this is really an exciting opportunity uh, to really make an impact in this in this area. Before I close, I also want to um, uh, take a second here and uh, pitch and course. Uh, so just recently, we developed a wildfire course uh, where we're going in much more details in different aspects. And uh, so this is a course offered in uh, spring 2024. For those of you interested in learning more about uh, the physics and the sciences of uh, wildfires, uh, specifically addressing environmental aspects, health impacts, uh, effects, as well as uh, uh, the current state of the art in the modeling of wildfires, uh, you're certainly welcome to reach out 
and be glad to talk to you about this this course. So with this, uh, let me finish here and take any questions. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. That was really illuminating. For, oops. Thanks a lot for that great talk. And uh, it was very illuminating to me to think about some of the fundamental processes and I'll open the floor to questions. I have some of my own, but I wanna let the audience have a chance to ask questions. Bill. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed it, but I, I'm uh, curious your interaction with NASA. I worked there for a, a few years. Yeah, uh, actually NASA started this this work, um, but not in biomass. Uh, originally, we developed this X-ray tomography experiment uh, for uh, heterogeneous combustion, and this is really combustion in porous media. Uh, so what we try to do there is to measure the gas phase temperature inside a porous media, and then we extended this work uh, to the biomass combustion. So all of the experimental techniques, the X-ray imaging was developed uh, uh, with support from NASA. Cool. Very cool. Thank you. I mean, Tia, I, I guess, you know, you spoke a lot to how this can be used to um, update existing models. Can you tell me more? I, I don't think the audience, or at least myself, know a lot about existing combustion models, um, whether it's small scale or large scale. Can you speak to what you were referring to in terms of how you would incorporate this in a model and whether you're talking about still fundamental small scale fires or how this would eventually feed to a large scale wildfire spread model? Yeah, good question. Um, so if you're thinking about large scale wildfire models, I think the first one that probably comes to mind is a Rothermel model, which is really just a flame spread model. Uh, so you have fire and it propagates um, uh, towards the unburned fuel mixers. Um, I would say for this case, um, you could use some of the models since pyrolysis plays a critical role, right? But as you better know than I, uh, Rothermel or some of the semi-empirical models don't have too much chemical insight. So we could essentially use this in order to provide a more chemical informed uh, combustion model, right? So instead of matching the flame spread, you would essentially predict the heat release and the combustion. So this is fire's propagation uh, doesn't know anything about amber transport. Now what you can do is you can augment your fire spread model with an amber transport model, and this would be essentially a particle model, right? So you have ways for predicting the breakup of your biomass into smaller particles, and you need additional models that account for the lofting and the transport of the small particles in the air, in the atmosphere, and the settling. For this case, I see a lot of opportunities here, since this entire amber transport, this particle transport, is very rarely considered in any uh, of the physical models, and if so, very empirical. Right, so here, I think we can provide some expertise uh, on uh, enhancing this, this capabilities to better, predict, to better predict the amber transport, the lifetime of these embers, and also the energy that is enco uh, encountered during the depositions in an unburdened environment. Okay. Does this make sense there? It does, thank you. Um, other questions? Ollie, go ahead. Hey. Uh, thank you so much for your great talk. I have a couple of questions um, about your experimental setup. Uh, what's the material type of material you can burn in your furnace? Is it is it because I saw that you mostly use plant materials? Can you also use uh, materials like soils to burn and study them? Like say it again. What kind of materials? Like soil. Soil? Yeah. Um, you can. Uh, so the, the main benefit of this X-ray imaging techniques is it has a very high penetration depth, right? And you can control the penetration depth essentially by the pathway, right? So if you have a very light sample, very low density, you have to increase the pathway in order to get uh, sub, uh, sub, substantial uh, attenuations. If you have a dense material, if you mentioned uh, soil materials, uh, certainly more dense than, than biomass, you would essentially have to look either to smaller samples or you increase your photon intensity or your photon flux. And uh, that's essentially done uh, by uh, using the synchrotron source. So the short answer is it is flexible for a wide range of applications and you have enough flexibility in terms of the experimental setup to probe uh, soil biomass 
uh, and um, even plastics if you if you prefer. Thank you. And my next question is, is there any limitation about the volume of the samples? You mentioned a little bit about that answering my first question, but is there any cutoff for the amount of sample that you should have to be able to study it? in terms of mass? Like, yeah. No, uh, not really. So um, what, what I showed you here is uh, the smallest size was about five millimeters in diameter. So. Uh, uh, 20th of an inch or 10th of an inch. Uh, the largest samples were on the order of um, a few inches. Uh, the real size, I would say at the lower side, there's no limitation as long as you can resolve this. Uh, the limitation comes at the upper side, right? Since we have this uh, laboratory scanner, we like to get as much of our sample in the field of view. Uh, so it's essentially limited by, by the experimental setup. And currently we are somewhat limited by uh, I would say, you know, few inches in, in diameter. Yeah. Awesome. And I think I, we can assume that we can collect sample after burning and characterize them using different methods, right? Yeah. You could do this, yeah. You could do this pre-combustion and post-combustion. I think what we'd like to do is to do this like in situ, right, during the combustion process, where we can really see the, the smoldering, right? So, but you can do this certainly as a, uh, prior to the combustion and uh, as post-combustion product. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have one question, a very a very ignorant, Matthias. I, I was looking at your first setup. I was trying to understand where the heat was coming from. I, it made sense to me in the second X setup at Berkeley that you have, you're surrounding it mm -hmm. and that would represent, you know, a tree or a branch being surrounded by heat. But in the first setup, I was trying to think of how gravity came into play. It seemed like you had sort of an object facing downward and the heat was from below. And I was wondering how, if that, if I interpreted that properly and whether that had any ramifications for combustion, because I would think gravity and buoyancy would come into play. So I was wondering if I missed understanding that or whether that's important or not in terms of thinking about gravity and how that comes into play in terms of combustion. Are you referring to this image here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the the heat is from below, right? You have an object that's being sort of heated from yeah. below, and I mean, I I mean, I'm trying to think of real wood and trees and vegetation yeah, burning. Yeah, 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 good point. Good point. I I see what you're saying. Is uh, right now it's essentially think about it as a, it's a stagnation flame, right? So we have a flame here. Um, so uh, mm -hmm. but this is our flame uh, sitting there, mm -hmm. uh, it impinges of the system, and we're getting essentially uh, the heating at the bottom. What we could certainly do is we could um, um, uh, um, immerse uh, our sample in this uh, uh, particle, and then you kind of reducing some of this uh, the buoyancy. But we were interested in by controlling the distance from the burner that we have control about mm -hmm. the heat flux. So it was a parametric choice. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot remove gravity. Uh, so uh, this would no, be- No, no, I, I know. But, <laughs> of course almost, not. But I have to be careful. Actually, we, we almost can do it, right? But then not with this X-ray techniques, right? So you, many of you probably know about some of the um, NASA ISS experiments uh, of droplets, particles. So there is certainly a way of eliminating gravity, but um, for our experiments, that, that's not an option, right? So you, if you go to microgravity uh, combustion facilities, this might be a way, but uh, we, happily live with gravity in this case. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't uh, saying that gravity is not important. I was guess I was wondering in terms of converting this to a real life combustion yeah. scenario. And I guess my follow-up question is, I assume you've already done, you compare, can you compare and contrast this experiment with the other one? Because yeah. you are providing a very different heat source in the high resolution second set of experiments. Yeah. So Did the, you notice any difference in the combustion process because it was surrounding as opposed to being exposed from below? Yeah, in this case, this is a pure combustion experiment. Here we have oxygen in the co-flow, right? That's the, the picture yeah. that I'm showing you here. This other figure was mm -hmm. just pyrolysis. So we had essentially the particle okay. su uh, suspended in krypton, and uh, we essentially tried only to uh, um, illuminate or understand uh, the pyrolysis reactions. And from this, they are kind of complementary, right? But what I really like on the second experiment is that uh, we have much better control about the, the heating rate. Uh, so here we can uh, control uh, with this heaters um, 
the heat input, and this provides perfect conditions to, to really tailor and uh, assess the parameter sensitivities. Right. Yeah, no, it certainly looks like there's a lot of advantages to the second setup. Yeah. Um, and I guess one more follow-up and I'll, I'll open the floor to any other remaining questions. Um, assuming you're not done, are you considering looking at things like chaparral? Like, so these are sort of hardwoods, I'm thinking of big trees, but have you considered like grassland fires or things like Southern California chaparral? Um, I think chaparral would certainly be an option. Uh, grassland fires, um, the, the issue that I'm seeing right now is uh, we are still limited by the acquisition time. And what I'm expecting is here, if you have grass, it just burns so fast uh, that we're not able to get some dynamics. Yeah. Good so I, I think, um, um, I believe Bill mentioned on whether you can do this uh, post-combustion, or actually, I'm, I'm sorry, Ali uh, asked on whether you can do post-combustion. I think this would be a really cool experiment there. Yeah. Right, so not in situ, yeah. but you do measurements prior and post-combustion. And so I think we could definitely do this, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that'd be very interesting to compare and contrast the different ones. That's excellent. All right, any other final questions? We're, we're almost at time. I would, sorry, I dominate some of the questions today. Any other questions? Bill, do you have any follow-up questions? I defer if anyone else does, but I do have one. Go okay. for it. So uh, I'm uh, working with the ME170 and we are working with some teams that are dropping uh, fire retardant in water. And we're finding that the um, interesting fluid dynamics of these things as they drop down out of the vehicles. And I'm just curious if you've considered taking some of your burning embers and putting them in a cross flow. And uh, I'll offer one thought, um, which is we used at, at NASA, we, we actually used to shoot things into a cross flow and they would stay in a position. Or it was, a, it was an interesting way to keep uh get a higher velocity in a location but i was just wondering if you're going to study you know a burning ember yeah. in a in it because it'd be very interesting to know the density the temperature and how it would affect its trajectory yeah oh beautiful question so you you're reading already our mind uh, actually you are ahead of us um we have been thinking about this process and if i go back to the slide deck what we have been thinking is uh to take our tube here oops sorry uh, to take this tube where we have, or let me sketch this up at the top. We have our sample here, and by controlling the flow rate at the bottom, we essentially have this cross flow arrangements. And I absolutely agree with you. Heat convection is the key mechanism, right? So um, looking to this isolated particle and heating this up, that's not representative of uh, realistic conditions. We have to think about uh, the convective and conductive heat transfer in the systems. Great idea. I think our current setup can do this uh, by changing just the cross flow or the, the mass flow rate at the bottom. Uh, we haven't exercised this to its fullest just now. Cool. Well, if you ever want to talk about it, I used to do a little bit of work like this. I mean, not, oh, awesome. not, not Ember work, but fluid mechanics work and stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing awesome this up. Awesome stuff. Yeah, to, to chat. Cool. All right, any, uh, any final questions? I, I think we have time for one more question. Well, Matthias, thank you for a, a very illuminating talk. I know a lot of people are gonna hear the recording, so you might get some follow-up questions. And gosh, I don't know if your email was on the slides, but you guys can know how to reach me. I'm on, the, I'm on the video with my email address if you have any questions for Matthias to follow up. Some fantastic work. Thanks for everyone's attention. Uh, stay tuned next week. We'll wrap up with a talk looking at sort of wildfire planning and issues at Stanford itself. Uh, thanks again for everyone's attention. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.